You guys are in for a treat. Um, we have a good friend of LifeWork. Um, it is his fourth time that he will be sharing some of his life, some of his experiences, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, with us today. And I am so blessed and fortunate to now also call him a personal friend and uh, mentor. Last year, I was uh, facing a transitioning challenge in my personal career journey, and uh, Martin was one of the first guys I phoned and invited for a breakfast, and he was gracious enough to, to come and sit and listen, and uh, very valuable advice, uh, which he shared with me. So, would you join me in welcoming Martin Kiskis? So, we're on the topic of, of relationships and uh, diversity and being intentional, learning from the life of Jesus as well, how, how he was intentional reaching out to, to all different types of people. And sometimes his Exco team might have even gotten a little uncomfortable with uh, some of the moves Jesus made and some of the people he invited to their table. Um, so we love in life work to, to do case studies and invite prominent business leaders uh, We've walked the talk and uh, experienced so many different things, and we just ask them questions out of their, their lives. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to use a fancy introduction and give this whole CV of Martin, because some of it will come out of the questions uh, you know, we'll be asking him. And at the end, you can already start thinking as he's talking, write down the question you, know, you, you would like to ask him uh, at the end. Martin, uh, you know, uh, maybe we can start there with... Uh, the first 20 years or so on, you know, from what are Damse Gaan says, yeah, and the direct English translation is from which uh, dams geese are you? Um, <laughs> uh, we just want to know, you know, where did you grow up and where did you come from? Uh, thanks, Ruan, and good morning. Uh, it's great to be with you this morning. I see some familiar faces here. Uh, I stay just about 10, 15 minutes away from here in Arabiaspur. I think this was the place that David had in mind when he said, I cast my eyes to the mountains, where shall my help come from? You know? <laughs> uh, this is where God resides in Arabiaspuart, and uh, been staying here for the last 15 years, and it's, it's a great place to be. Coming back to the question, um, I was born uh, in a place called Klaxdor. Ajay uh, van <laughs> Klaxdor! Waar van Klerkzorg? Flamwood. No, this, you know, the, there's always a railway line that separates the town. <laughs> Flamwood is the wrong side of the railway. <laughs> that explains a lot. Uh, mine, was, mine was actually the worst side of the railway. <laughs> uh, I come from a place called Klerkzorg, uh, the eldest of a family of eight. And, uh, you know, I was brought up uh, in a very uh, strict Christian background. As a matter of fact, uh, I guess when you have a stool in the church. Is there a stool in the church? There's no one. I was brought up in the Apostolic Faith Mission and, you know, a uh, very strong Christian upbringing. But there came a time in my life uh, where, uh, you know, I just wandered away from God. Didn't put my foot in the church for 14 years. Uh, and was out in the world having fun and as if I didn't have any cares in the world. Those are also very tough days because I'm trying to capture 63 years of my life here. You know? um, and, and you know, things were tough those years. And, um, but I always had destiny on my mind. Leadership just came so natural to me. Um, and um, yes, I started off, uh, I was a university dropout. I was in Western Cape. As a matter of fact, my claim to fame there was the official Shabin at Western Cape University in 1973. Uh, that was my claim to fame. There. So I dropped out of university. Um, because of family reasons, my father walked out on us for 25 years. Uh, and um, I then joined a profession, the nursing profession. And uh, I dropped out from that dream, but then I joined the nursing profession. I was actually a nurse for 17 years. Can you believe it? I know how to clean a bedpan, okay? 
uh, I, I've, got, I've gone through it all. Done my diploma in general nursing. After that, I got a degree through UNISA in nursing education. I became a lecturer, started teaching in nursing colleges, and later on in administration. But during those 17 years in the nursing profession, two very important milestones in my life. The one was in uh, Ward 7 in July 1979, night duty. Uh, your imaginations are fertile, I could see. You know, your, your eyes are sparkling, you're thinking about what could have happened. Which hospital? It was Tsepong Hospital uh, in Klaxop where I was working. And I was working there with one of my colleagues, who um, was my senior by then. And you know, we used to work seven nights in, seven nights out. And uh, I tell you, those were the longest seven nights off in my life because I realized something happened here, you know. I'm missing something. When, this, the, when we came in for the next seven nights, I made a proposal to this colleague of mine, was vehemently opposed, I pursued, and through God's grace, on the 4th of December 1981, we got married. <laughs> so now uh, I've been married for the last 38 years to Elizabeth. The Lord has blessed us uh, with three wonderful children and two grandchildren, the only downside. I only see my grandchildren once per year because they stay in Melbourne, Australia, uh, talking about diversity. And um, th that's the first milestone. The second milestone, just 10 months after I got married, on the 9th of October, 1982, in a small little church in Alabama, that Sunday night, the word of the Lord came to me. And that night, I gave my life to Christ. And instead of my life going south, my life just went into a very, very favorable situation. Because by that time, what only separated me from the rest of the alcoholics, and I was deep into all manner of funny things out there. I mean, that was the township. It was survival in the township life. It was that white uniform. Otherwise, it was a rascal out. And the Lord got hold of me. And, up, and I can say without any fear of contradiction, I've never looked back and the Lord started blessing me. I progressed in my career. Things started to happen. I, be, I became a lecturer. After that, a manager. But I was very active in my community. Very active in the church life, uh, church leadership as well. Now, I was not the guy that burned, uh, you know, through petrol bombs. and uh, uh, I didn't burn down schools and stuff and throw stones. But I was very strategic in the political circles. That was an extension of my faith. I worked amongst in the edu education side, on the health side, because there were no structures in the townships. And yes, uh, that led me to uh, start to rise in leadership ranks also in my community, where in 1993, the ruling party on the eve of the election approached me to avail myself of political office. I submitted that to my pastor. Pastor Tim Salmon was my pastor by then. And, uh, you know, after two weeks, uh, came back and there was confirmation in my heart, in my wife's heart, as well as confirmation through my pastor that this is the direction that God wants to lead me. Cut a long story short, in 1994, after the elections, I was elected into the Northwest Provincial Legislature. The Saturday we were sworn in, the next week, Thursday afternoon, the Premier called us all in one big room. Papa Malefa was a Premier by then. And, um, you know, he told us a long story about the challenges and so on, and said, well, this is the team that must help me to uh, move this process forward. And he ran out the names of his first cabinet. When he came to number seven, he said the finance portfolio will go to Martin Cuskers. Now, I didn't... Finance. finance portfolio. The finance portfolio. Now, I didn't know a debit from a credit, okay? <laughs> and here I'm called upon to manage 5.8 billion rand. Talk about faith. I really needed faith. I had to pray even to go and meet Saul Kersner because we had shareholding, the Northwest government in Sun International those days and so on. 
I have to trust God for every move in my life. And as I'm sitting to you and talking to you, ladies and gentlemen, I still hold the distinction through God's grace of being the longest serving MEC of finance in this country. Heads were rolling all over the place. Me and Jabu Mulekete were the only guys that survived two successive terms. And go and talk to your friend Google. You will not find, through God's grace, a single scandal behind my name. God sustained me there, and I was able, through God's grace, to represent the kingdom well in that environment. But you know when your name starts appearing at the golf club as an honorary member, <laughs> then you know your time is up. Now, if you go to Leopard Park Golf Club, now you'll see my name there. With my 18 handicap, I was an honorary member then. And, uh, you know, we went to a place called Marimola for a week, me and my wife, and just see God's face as to what is the next phase of our lives. Ten years now in politics and so on. And uh, we spent time in a little place called... Uh, hotel called Shangri-La, and there wasn't any earthquakes, thunder, lightning, and so on. Just that reassurance in our heart that our time is up, and whatever I was supposed to do in Mafi King, I've done it, I must move on. I resigned from political office, and I didn't even know uh, where my next uh, destination is going to be. I was approached by the banks and all other places, uh, to, 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 uh, for, for, for possible uh, employment uh, opportunities, but I ultimately landed in a place called the South African Bureau of Standards. Now, Sorry, Martin, if you don't mind me interrupting you. The SABS, uh, we all know, is the South African it's Bureau of Standards. It's not the breweries, okay, are we talking the <laughs> South African There's an standards. S at the end. And um, if you don't mind me just interrupting you here and sketching a little bit of a scenario of what happened when, when Martin was approached and he accepted the position of CEO uh, of the SABS. Now, 10 days before his first day of starting in this new position, a former disgruntled employee uh, who was dismissed walked into the boardroom, shot a few people, and then ended up killing himself as well. Ten days later, Martin walks into a new position in an untransformed environment as you could possibly get. Lots of scientists, people with 30 plus years of service at that organization. Can you imagine the toxic environment? Speak about organizational culture and, you know, distrust and fear and all those things happening there. And here's this new guy stepping into the, uh, onto the scene, and uh, he had a mandate to, to fast-track transformation within that organization. Um, so some of the challenges, there's uh, Dr. Fani, who's been in his position for, I'm sure, many years, and he's brilliant at what he's doing. And here's a young scientist, up and coming, needing mentorship. Were there any tensions uh, in, in that situation, in that room? Well, it was uh, quite a you know, unique situation. Uh, you walk in there and the air was almost, you, you could cut it with a knife. It was thick and loaded. The atmosphere there was an atmosphere of anticipation, but also an, an atmosphere of fear. And here comes Martin, and they expected me to be MacGyver with a pocket knife, perform a few stunts, and fix this place. And for a hundred days, I kept quiet. I was just walking around, soaking up the atmosphere, plugging in with people, and finding out for myself, because there were just so many contradictions. You speak to this one, say, pass up for thy man. You speak to that one, that's the one that made your predecessor to be fired here. Yeah. You know, all sort of, all sort of things. And it was a transformation effort that went terribly wrong. Because you see in transformation, the easy side is the mechanical side. Draw an organogram, how many black faces must replace white faces. That's the easy part. But it's the dynamics, how to manage the transformation. That was sadly lacking. 
And that was the work that confronted me to make that place meaningfully transform and set a platform for a sustainable business there. So if we can pause here for a moment, uh, and the dilemma being related to the topic of relationships, diversity in the workplace, um, you're now in Martin's shoes, in that exact environment. We sketch the surroundings for you, you have the same mandate. Let's take a few minutes and discuss around your exco or board tables, how would you have handled that situation? And we would like two or three steps you would have followed. And uh, one of the first things you might have implemented uh, to change that ship around and move it uh, into a different direction. Let's take a few minutes. Martin, over to you. Uh, I mean, what an interesting discussion uh, we had. But tell us, part of the strategy God gave you, uh, as his son, as his servant, obviously sent you on a mission there to go and uh, implement change. Uh, what happened? Yeah, um, well, some of the elements that people alluded to uh, was part of, of my journey there. Uh, you see, on the one end, you had legitimate fears of people that didn't know any other life except the SABS. Out of school, first job, 39 years, PhD in physics and all sorts of things, world experts in own name and right, and they've seen the culling that happened in other institutions, am I going to be the next victim? So you had these legit legitimate fears, but you also had reasonable expectations from these that just entered some of the emerging Yosipos, Yuntabi Sengs, Mzwandi and them, these guys also went to VITS. And they also came with expectations that this organization will give us the necessary learning experiences to advance our careers. How do you balance the two? The first thing that I had to address was to challenge the paradigms. There were some very deep-seated paradigms there. There was, for example, an age paradigm. Ons het alle jare die goed is so gedoen. Die professor van julle het nog nooit in die praktijk gewerkt. So there's that age paradigm. Young people come with fresh ideas and the old people say, no, no, no. This thing worked for the last 30 years. And, and so we had to challenge the age. We had to challenge the gender paradigm. It was a very male-dominated environment, engineering, hardcore male guys, you know, and females were not always treated uh, in, a, in a sensitive uh, manner. We had to challenge the race paradigm. And uh, the race paradigm, we, and how did we challenge these paradigms? We had people in focus group discussions drawn from various sections and different levels of the organization and we will actually speak about these things openly, and it was facilitated uh, by uh, Dr. David Malapo, Dr. Ketsu Mabusela. Who knows on Blackie Swartz here? Yeah. Now, Blackie Swartz brought an interesting flavor because on Blackie Swartz was actually a play white. He was a general, uh, um, some people in the army, he was a very, and he, and he hid his half whiteness behind racism. And he wanted to block out black people not to discover that he's not as pure a white as he is. And he became one of the most staunchest racists in the army. And the Lord turned his life around. So we brought on Blackie in and he invited the guys into this new world of freedom to be what you can be without, you know, these hang-ups of racism and so on. And yeah, there we had an 87% participation rate. I've personally sat in meetings where people walked out. I guess I did so. 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 I guess I so. I guess I did so. I guess I did so. I guess I this is what you're thinking about me. I'm sorry. 
I've seen how this thing, when they started engaging, it was built on perceptions and not reality. Because once you interrogate the facts, somebody said something around a Bryfless fire after they came back from Loftus to say, you were these waters, a slum scallops. You must have a good check. And it's like a good And then somebody heard somewhere in a stock fell, then a Shabin, and on his way to the taxi to work, on whites are racist. Whites doesn't want to vote, the poor have only changed it. And that formed, formed the lens through which they view the world. And then you start asking them, do you really know the 40 million blacks in South, 40 odd million blacks in South Africa by name? And if you experience, it will all of you geleeg. It will all of you have gesteel. And then what it will have you have gesteel. No, then it will be there with my own place and my tiny hands and all that. But we are talking about you now. You say that they are geleeg, they are steel. And we confront the blacks. You say they are like this, they are like that. What, what, what happened? No, no, it's just, you know, so you won't understand. No, no. Let, and the more we put the facts on the table, we realize these are perceptions. Somebody said something at a briefless fire. So we challenge this. There's also a geographical paradigm. Head office and the regions. We had 12 regional offices. And everything, you know, Wolfgang to what it's saying. It's not Wolfgang to what it's saying. Noting his order from above and all those. And the people in the regions felt, you know, this paradigm, they, they, they're doing hard work on the ground there, and we are just sitting here at the top and dictating what should be done. The second phase that we, we then, after that, reach consensus what the new SEP should look like. We call the game Snakes and Ladders. You know Snakes and Ladders? Uh, it's a generational thing. Some of you have never played it, I guess. Uh, but, uh, because you play solitaire and those guys. We used to play snakes and ladders. <laughs> that game where you throw the dice and certain things take you up and certain things bring you down. And we define we, we, we for ourselves what are the things that brings us down and what are the things that take us up. And zoom into those type of things that will make for a better SAPS. We then captured these things in a roadmap. We set ourselves a roadmap for five years because if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And after that, we had a big ceremony where we all bought into, you know, your normal thumbprint things and so on, and we printed it into a book, and then I had to maintain the momentum through my leadership team. And how did I maintain the momentum? Firstly, it was to lead by example. You see, leadership stands or falls on what is, credibility stands or falls on what is represented at the top. If people at the top are not living credible lifestyles, if they're not living by example, don't expect the people at the bottom. Another unfortunate incident, two of the people that I brought into, and, uh, and both of them Christians, by the way, <laughs> tongue-speaking fellows, uh, the one was the marketing, uh, the, uh, you know, executive, and the other one was the HR executive. You know, marketing executive messed around with my credit card after working only seven months for me. And everybody was watching now. What is the boss going to do with this fellow? I had to fire the guy, you know. I had to ask him to go. <laughs> you don't mess with my credit card because one of the things we all sign up for was honesty in this company. I to ask the HR who, who brought one of her cousins in, sit in the interview, don't declare interest, you know, to go. And once they saw that, listen, even the people that the boss brought in is not exempted from scrutiny, they went. We also had to select champions because this thing is not always driven by management. There are people that's talented, that's got the capability to influence others there. We selected champions throughout the group to start driving this message. But I had these very 
interactive sessions every second week with staff members called Martin's Moments. And Martin will have 25 people in a room with a bowl of muffins there, coffee, and we will talk. How the transformation efforts in this company is affecting you. Because you see, my mentor told me the last time you became CEO, uh, the last time people told you, told you the truth was the day you became CEO. After that, they would just filter all the nice things to the top. And all these other bad things, you'll never hear about it. And you need to do dipsticks for yourself from time to time to find out whether these things are still on track. And that's what I've done. And we only ask three questions. What happened? What's missing? What's next? How, what happened since we went through this transformation journey? How are you experiencing it? What's missing? What are you seeing on ground floor that we're not seeing there from the eighth floor? And what's next? The moment you say, I tell us what's missing, you also need to prepare. And there was such a great amount of peer learning that took place. Things that other divisions has already overcome, which people could learn from. And we were also able to nip in the bud all these rumor mongers. We disarmed them because there were also those that peddled lies. You know, they're going to retrench us. I get to work. Yeah, that's it. I can't come here, so. Hij is een stil voor een rukkie, hulle is bezig om een plan te kook daar. Ek het gehoor daar. En je disarm die rumor mongers, because those 25 people heard it now from the boss himself. And I also had a, an interactive website where people could post on that website anything that affects them on this whole transformation journey. Another thing that we've done was to break the glass ceiling. You know, uh, it was a big issue. Uh, you have these guys with their white dust coats. They are very, very technically, you know, they, they, they're excellent. But they're bad managers. They're irritable in the meetings. Uh, they don't want to sit and go through processes, you know. And, and, uh, you know, that's the work to do. You know, that type of attitude. And we created a technical stream, and we've also created a management stream. So, Om Havi, who used to be head of the pump laboratory for the last 20 odd years, who hated it to sit in meetings, we appointed Osipo now as the head of uh, the mechanical division. And Om Havi reported to Sipo now. But Om Gavi had a new title. He was the technical, senior technical specialist. We didn't touch Om Gavi's pocket. But we know Om Gavi had three functions for me to perform. You're going to retire in three years' time? One, all the knowledge that's in your head, I want it on paper. We had a knowledge management system now where somebody will just sit and listen to Omghavi and write everything down on the processes and so on. Omghavi had three people or four people that we've identified that he must mentor, and 30% of his bonus depends on how he mentored those people. And thirdly, Omghavi also had to make sure that the work is done. Because, you see, you can't have all these niceties, mentorship, and so on, and the work is not done. <laughs> and, you know, some of them, and Omdavi and these guys used to come to me long before time and say, Okasi, oh, that like for me, I must go. I like to give you right. You have a chance here. I trust that. Like that girl is right. That girl. Ze gaan of joh, ze gaan voor hoe goud werk is. They started themselves to see, you know, that the value of their investment and they could exit without being humiliated. Je moet gaan. His pocket wasn't touched. In fact, he was incentivized to capacitate others. And thirdly, he left there. And people were put in there on merit, not because they are Om Gavi's friends and they drink with him somewhere and they have pride, but because 
of merit. We also want to make sure that we celebrate all our successes. And we captured these things and we made big bells and whistles about all these type of things. These were obviously not easy tasks. Because, you know, with all these things, there's always people, once you bring order, there are certain elements in an organization that only thrives in an atmosphere of chaos. Once you bring order and everybody understands the rules of the game, these people become irrelevant. <laughs> and these are the people now on the sides. Yeah, you know. And they always see and they don't know what's happening because they have become irrelevant. They are no more the guys that knew everything about everybody because we all know everything about this organization. It's open, it's transparent. What was the result of this? One is that I was, we were able, the secretary of Nehau, Tabo, as I'm talking to now, he's head of the radiation, he's general manager, a uh, senior manager of the radiation unit in SABS. By the time I was there, Tavo completed his MBA at Vitz, Vitz Gibbs, uh, at Gibbs, and Tavo is now developed into a fully fledged manager. A lot of these guys started to emerge because they didn't have to fight for nonsense anymore and fight for recognition. It was open for everybody. And yes, I can't tell you where it is at this point in time. Um, don't blame me for what, it, I'm just giving you what happened the five years I was there. But we were able to advance real transformation. As a matter of fact, we uh, were able to expand our footprint in 16 countries. We had a much more diverse workforce. Our profitability increased. We were even in the top 10 certification bodies in the world and in 2006, I was elected on the ISO Council in Ottawa. And I used to fly to Geneva at least five, six times a year, sitting in the International ISO Council because of the work that we've done there. So diversity, it's not, you know, just changing white faces with black faces. It's doing the right things right and yes it's going to be uncomfortable it's going to be unfamiliar territory but it's to what extent you believe in the future sustainability of that organization i think that deserves a round of applause <laughs> so just before we go to uh, questions from the audience uh, tell us in a one minute version about life after the SABS. Maybe just mention a few of the names and organizations. You life mentioned. after SABS, uh, my contract ended there 2009. Uh, 2010, I went into self imposed sabbatical. There was World Cup. I had enough, I received a good bonus when I left. I had enough tickets to watch soccer and so on. And we were having waka waka and those kind of things. You remember those days, man? Uh, but now, for the last 11 years, I've been a, a non-executive director of ne of the, on the board of Netcare, where I had the social and ethics, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, quality uh, assurance uh, committee. I'm part of the social and ethics committee as well as the risk committee there. I've also, um, uh, for the la for nine years, I've been the chairman of the Mine Workers Provident Fund, where we took all the way away, all the work away from momentum started our own administration platform of 148,000 members. And yes, for the last eight years, we had clean, successive clean audits, and that's why I could walk away there last year in October. I'm on the board of Liberty Corporate Umbrella Funds. I've joined Bijan last year in, in, in May. I'm also uh, on the board of Alice, representing the interests of Mazi. The share price at the moment is 12 cents. Don't blame it on me. 
Uh, and then, uh, obviously, you know, uh, kingdom-wise, I, uh, I'm on, uh, I, I deliberately structured myself in such a way that I've got a margin of time to also invest in people development. So I, I do work at Coram Deo. Do you know Coram Deo? It's a big counseling center, one of the biggest counseling centers in Pretoria. It's run by NG Kerk Westerlich. And uh, they do this program, Narrative Pastoral Counseling, there. I've, uh, I've got my <laughs> diploma last year, cum laude, with the keys. And then I'm also uh, on the board of Lead Like Jesus, where we go into corporates as well as individuals and dealing, you know, uh, with this program of. of um, Ken Blanchard, he started it on the heart, the head, the habits, and the hands of Jesus, how to lead like Jesus in our environments. And, uh, yeah, do a bit of work here at Life Work. And, uh, yeah, partner in a coaching practice called The Makings. Wow. Um, what a man. <laughs> we have a few minutes left for... Um two or three of the best questions uh, at Burning, which you would really like to... Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I can see Graham here at uh, Vovotelo at the coffee shop. You don't need to <laughs> ask the question. Yeah. We're going to skip him. Um, let me choose a few of the people who have not asked anything yet. Thank you. Um, coming into an organization... Sorry, what's your name? Miriam. Miriam, okay, because I don't want to talk to the lady with a black cap. Okay, <laughs> Miriam is my name. Coming into a big organization and being the leader, and you've obviously sh shared your challenges there, there must have been a lot of personal development that needed to take place on your side in order to lead such big organizations. What did you do in terms of taking care of yourself, empowering yourself as a leader in order to be effective? Excellent question. Uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, to be at the top, you need to always empower yourself. Uh, I had to leave uh, my home at times in the cold winters of England and go and spend December, for example, going to the London School of Economics for five weeks. There was a time when I had to go to Harvard University, uh, gone spend six weeks there, six days a week. We finished three o'clock on, on a Saturday, and Monday morning we're back in class again, uh, doing uh, their programs. And a host of other things that I do, because, you know, you can't blame apartheid indefinitely. Uh, yeah, you, you talk like this because uh, you undermine me because I, I had Bantu education, you know, those sort of things. No. At some stage, you need to take responsibility and empower yourself. But my biggest empowerment comes from the Word of God. And this I say unashamedly. You know, the Word of God has answers for virtually everything. Everything that pertains to life and godliness, I find it in the Word. But thirdly, also, I have very good mentors that I relate to. People that can give me honest and objective advice and tell it to, you know, they don't owe me anything and uh, they're not obligated to be praising us to me. Good mentors. And yes, obviously, one of the, th the thing that, that really touched me was when I did a program halftime for nine months. Uh, and uh, one of the disciplines they taught us there was solo retreats, where at least once a month. You had Good Shepherd. There's a nice little retreat there. You should know the place, Baron. I just spent a day, day and a half there. No telephone, no you know, social media, nothing of that sort, just getting quiet and tapping in. And, 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 and leaders can sometimes be in such a rush that we don't press that pause button and just take stock. What happened? What's missing? What's next? I hope if I haven't convinced you that I've at least confused you. 
Next question. Mm. Martin uh, Vickers, yeah? Oh, yes, Vickers. So, the question I've got is, you having been there from the start when the transition happened, and in terms of um, transformation in our country, how far, in your opinion, have we come as a country in terms of transformation, and what still needs to be done, and where do we need to go, in, in your opinion? And it, your answer might require calling a spade a shovel, but uh, I'm just wondering what your take is, because we've got the images from the media, we've got the conversations around the bris, but what, uh, and also small and medium enterprises, big enterprises that you've been dealing with, where are we at and where do we need to go? Well, because we are certainly not where we were in 1994. But I'll be the first to admit that we're not where we should be. There's been a lot of opportunities that's been squandered in the meantime. And, uh, you know, because uh, uh, the mere fact that me and you now can send our children to any school we want, we can engage in any recreational activity, play the same sort of sports and all those sort of things. Uh, I, I, that was one side of the normalization of society. But I don't think we have done sufficient work to actually interrogate sufficiently, you know, and have a clearer understanding about each other's lived experiences. And my lived experience and your lived experience is sometimes so diverse that you can take certain things for granted, and yet for me it's a big issue. Am I talking to the right audience? Yeah. And some of these things sometimes, you know, it's almost like the Bible describes these little foxes that destroys the vineyard. And when something flares up, we don't do it in an empowering way, it's more a reaction. Yeah, die man wil nie reg kom. Is nou alles getraai. Is gaan een beetje uitsaad. Sit nieuwe regulaties in. Sit dit, doen dit. You know what I'm trying to say? We have, we've squandered that opportunity. Look, for example, uh, the latest rep uh, report on the uh, employment equity thing, you know. Uh, women and uh, still very badly represented in boardrooms, you know, especially black women. Are they bad managers? I don't think so. We don't do sufficient work to advance them. But the old boys club, I tell you, they just circulate. They recommend each other to these positions all the time. And the woman is kept out. A whole host of other parameters I don't want to get into here because you might question my statistics. But it is evident we're not where we should be. How, how should we go about these things? One... I want to ask the question this morning to you. Who, who are your friends? Who are your friends? If you, your friends are just from the same circle, on that same rugby spiel, and you uh, know, I like the you actually impoverish yourself. You must make a deliberate effort to get to widen your friendship circle, you know, into a much more diverse one. From a very tender age. I had friends in Dorenkrein, my, fr my friend from La Hof will, will know where's Dorenkrein. I had friends there with Ma Malcolm Russell and them. Because it just broadened my perspective about life to have a better understanding at that level. So who are your friends? Secondly, who are your role models? Everybody is, if I ask who's your role model, then Mandela is my role model. Uh, more drone models than Mandela. There might be an ordinary man who is just a wise old man working with you there that has seen much more of life than you would have seen in your lifetime. Start emulating that role model. Thirdly, what do you communicate, what do you model to your children? If you start modeling to your children over the dinner table every night, your perspective about life, that is what they're going to take to school tomorrow, isn't it so? When they get into school, 
Or they get into the rugby field, want paard mos gesê, die mense, ons moet versichtig is vir hulle. En nou bly versichtig daar, en die soos een baie, baie sene vir een vir acht, sene vir achtige konijn, daar op die werf. Bang, iemand gaan om raak skiet. Because, pa het gesê, jy het gesê, ek moet het moest net sê, soos ek, die mense lyk so ernstig in die saal, en is jy kwaad vir my, man. ons praat mys uit liefde, het is, die ander ding, is, so, who are your friends? What do you model to your children? Who are your role models? Fortly, generalizations. It's so easy to generalize, you know. And Archie Amanda puts it so beautifully, said that the problem with, that, uh, with, with generalizations, it makes your truth the only truth. It makes your truth the only truth. And ons question jou nie eens nie, want, uh, jy weet, ons generalize sommer net, oh, hulle, die mense. <laughs> no, no, no. Let's go into the specifics. For the record, I was in 2011, I was, ek was die president van die Afrikaanse Handelsinstituut. I used to carry a chain like a mayor in town when I go to Port Gietersris. Meneer die president. <laughs> And even in that environment, I've learned beautiful virtues amongst the folks from Potgietersris. They might have spent an hour to dis- discuss whether Meneer the President would come prat of the not. But as they so big van NP van Weiklo vertellen, dan raak die ouwens baie gemakkelijk. En dan keir ons tot baie laat. Then we can talk. Because how desperate are you for this country to be transformed? We can't, it's, it's too serious a task to leave it to politicians. Start with where you are. Just stay where you are. Make a difference. Start engaging with that guy that puts in petrol every day for you. I discovered that total, that that boy actually has got matric. But he's there. And sometimes they just need access to information. Acts of your forums create out by the police stars. And you connect. You haven't changed the world, but you've changed a life. And that's, that's the journey of transformation. Start with where you are. Don't wait for anything big, dramatic. And if each one can do that on, you know, in our own sphere of influence, this country can be turned around. There's no amount of darkness that can distinguish light. You might look like a candle in your workplace, but nevertheless, you know the temptation of having a microphone, I like to talk. How far are we from here? One more question. Um, <clears throat> Martin, I am Francois. Oh, Francois. So I don't have a question. I maybe just want to make a statement. Um, so I'm a, I'm a Burki. I'm a white Afrikaner. And uh, I, what I want to say is, you know, listening to you and knowing South Africa and where we are, I would gladly follow you. Um, you know, as a white South African and as a leader myself, um, I, I really believe we need more leaders like you, white and black, that think like you think, um, that's willing to cross that barrier. And I fully agree with you. Government's not going to save the country at all. It is going to be us. Um, people in this, so I commend you. Um, I think you should we, should, we definitely need more of you. Um, you surely inspired me. I think you inspired a lot of the people in this room. That's a fact. So no question, just a statement. Thank you for your service. And uh, thank you that I think you bring hope not just to, well, surely me being white and Afrikaans, not that, you know, it really matters these days, but surely that you bring that kind of hope and inspiration to people that's not my color. So, thank you, sir. Thank you, Francois.